Hello everyone, this is the third of three lessons on cellular respiration. The first two, of course, were on glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. This one will be on oxidative phosphorylation. Remember that through the processes of glycolysis and uh, the Krebs cycle, there was some ATP that was produced, but it really wasn't a lot. It was a measly four ATP that were generated. What was also generated, of course, was the other chemical form of energy, which is reducing power. So a whole bunch of NADH was produced and some ATP was produced. So just to kind of refresh your memory, there were two NADHs that were produced from the one glucose after glycolysis. There were two more NADHs that were produced, this intermediate step going from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, one NADH for each conversion from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Each turn of the Krebs cycle, it was three NADHs, but of course, for each turn, that's one acetyl-CoA, one pyruvate, but from each glucose, we have two pyruvate and two acetyl-CoA, which gives us the grand total of six more NADHs. So using glycolysis, the intermediate step in the Krebs cycle, we have a total of 10 NADHs, which can now be used for the process of oxidative phosphorylation. FADH, not quite as many of those, one for each turn of the Krebs cycle, so we have two FADHs that can now contribute to the further production of ATP. This picture that we're taking a look at here, just to orient ourselves first of all, in terms of the different structures and parts of the mitochondria. This is all inside of the mitochondria. So at the bottom here, this is going to be the mitochondrial matrix inside of the inner membrane. This membrane here is the inner mitochondrial membrane. And at the top, I won't write it, but that is the intermembrane space. So that is between the outer and the inner mitochondrial membranes. The inner mitochondrial membrane is a very complex. It is not just a phospholipid bilayer, but it is studded with a whole bunch of different proteins that have multiple different functions, of which we will be talking about some of them. So overall, what we are going to see is that the NADHs and the FADH2, they are reducing power, which means that they have the ability to transfer electrons and reduce something else. Where they are transferring these electrons to, are electron carriers in the electron transport system or the electron transport chain. So when they initially transfer the electrons, the electrons have a higher amount of energy. As we do have the passage going from left to right through the electron transport chain, they are losing some of their energy, so they have lower energy. So the electrons ultimately did come from the glucose and the other foodstuffs. They're being transmitted through the reducing power, high energy electron carriers, NADH and FEDH2, into the electron transport chain. Where are these electrons going at the end? Well, this is what you need oxygen for. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. It is the strongest oxidizing agent, which means it's going to cause everything else to lose electrons. So we kind of have electrons that are being drawn in this direction, eventually combining with the oxygen and protons. And this is where we have one of the products of cellular respiration the water that's being produced at the same time that we have one of the reactants that's being used as well, which is the oxygen. Keep in mind, the other reactant, the glucose, was already broken down way at the beginning, the first stage in glycolysis, and carbon dioxide, the other product along with water that is produced in cellular respiration, that was produced in the intermediate step, going from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, and in the Krebs cycle. So energy can't be created or destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. So if we do have higher energy electrons at the beginning of the electron tran transport chain and lower at the end, where did that energy go? Well, that energy went to take protons, H+, plus, that are in the matrix and pump them into the intermembrane space. 
So when we say pump, that means that it is an energy requiring process, but it's not using ATP. The point of this is eventually to make ATP. So the energy that's being tapped into in order to move these protons in the opposite direction that they want to move in, in other words, going against their concentration gradient, the energy that's being used is the energy of electrons, transmitting the electrons through the electron transport chain, concentrating the protons in the intermembrane space, and now what we have is referred to as an electrochemical potential. There are more hydrogen in the intermembrane space than in the matrix, so they want to go into the matrix. There are more positive charges in the intermembrane space than there are in the matrix, so they are also drawn into the matrix for that reason. Ions cannot pass through a phospholipid bilayer. That simply cannot happen. So in order for these protons to make it back into the matrix, they only have one route, and that is passing through this protein right here, transmembrane protein, which is also an enzyme, and this is the ATP synthase. So as those protons are going through the ATP synthase, they're using that form of energy, the electrochemical potential, the concentration gradient, and using that to combine together ADP and phosphate to make our ATP. So again, you can think of, it's really just the transfer of electrons, starting from the glucose, eventually ending up, reacting with the oxygen to produce the water. These electrons at the top of the staircase that we see here, they have higher energy. I'll just put an H for higher down at the bottom. They have lower energy. We're tapping into that energy in order to make ATP. Some of the ATP made in glycolysis, some of it in the Krebs cycle, most of it though in oxidative phosphorylation. So this picture here again showing much of the same information that we did see with the previous slide, but what it does show is this is our NADH which is in the matrix, FADH2 which is in the matrix, electrons that we get going through the electron transport chain, eventually combining with oxygen to produce the water. Protons accumulating in the intermembrane space. As they go back from the intermembrane space into the mitochondrial matrix, the only way that they can get there is by passing through the ATP synthase. As they go through the ATP synthase, that's going to provide the energy to make the ATP. So in terms of oxidative phosphorylation, this entire process is oxidative phosphorylation. It is made up of the electron transport chain and the actual production of ATP using the proton gradient is referred to as chemiosmosis. Numbers that we then have, if we go back to glycolysis, 